My name is Nayaswami Sadhana Devi. This is Nayaswami Jaya, and it's our joy to be here with you today. I'd like to read from Rays of the One Light, Commentaries on the Bible in Bhagavad Gita by Swami Kriyananda. The topic today is the best way to, to worship. Truth is one and eternal. Realize it, realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. In chapter 4 of the Gospel of St. John, the woman of Samaria asks Jesus, Where is the best place to worship? This might, question might be expanded to include what is the best church? What is the best religion? Is it important to go to pilgrimage to holy shrines? What is the best ritual? What is the best mantra or prayer? Jesus cut across all such question, questioning with his reply. The hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship, worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It was not that outer considerations of place, church, ritual, etc. are irre irre irrelevant. Each person should find those practices and observances which are compatible with his own nature. One might say with his own vibrations. Not everyone's natural path is the same. God sent different religions into the world to satisfy different human needs. The overarching concern, however, considering that the goal is to find God, is to include in one's worship daily inner communion with the Lord. God is silence. He must be sought, therefore, in inner silence. God is absolute love. He must be sought, therefore, in the silence of love. God is spirit, and thus immaterial. He must be sought above all in the expanding peace of deep meditation. Thus the Bhagavad Gita states in the sixth chapter, sequestered should he sit, steadfastly meditating, solitary, his thoughts controlled, his passions laid away from every craving for possession, freed. Wherever you are, whatever your outward beliefs and observances, seek God in the silence of your own soul. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om. Welcome. I'd like to begin this morning's uh, discourse with the reading from Whispers from Eternity. My eyes are enthralled, O oh Father, with the beauty of earthly flowers, with life's passing senses, and with the sailing silent clouds. Everywhere, all I see hints at thy divine hidden presence. Open that eye in me which sees only thee. With that gaze may I behold thee above, beneath, all around, within, and outside me. Teach me in all things to see only thee. Open in me that eye which beholds everywhere thy hidden, but ever subtly reigning wonder. This morning's topic, what is the best way to worship God? Uh, this morning as I came up to the uh, upstairs where we get dressed before the uh, service here, Naiswami Kyandiv asked me, so, Jaya, <laughs> what is the best way to worship God? 
with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength. I think that about sums it up right there. But I do have a few other words to share also. <laughs> the, uh, uh, as Actually, I'd like to ask a question first before we get started. I understand that this is also a first-timer's weekend. And uh, I was wondering how many people, if you'd care to raise your hands, how many are here for the very first time? Well, that's a pretty good number. I mean, that must be seven or eight or so folks here for the very first time. Well, Sadhana Devi and I, Swami Sadhana Devi and I, uh, we have for the last eight years or thereabouts been mainly serving in India. And we're here for a while, and I returned to India in the latter part of June. I mention that because today, as I tell stories and make references, I probably will be making them referencing India. And so now you know why, if you might understand why. <laughs> because it, uh, it's, it's informed my spiritual life, you might say, for the last number of years. For those of you who read world news, perhaps read the newspaper, internet, to uh, keep up with such things, you may have noticed that over the last couple of weeks, a couple of weeks ago, India concluded its every five-year national elections. Now, this is quite a remarkable thing, actually, because over 500 million people vote there. And it's remarkable that in a country as vast as India, not so much territorially vast, because the United States is for sure bigger than India, but in a country with such a vast population and diversity of population, to be able to come together and over a period of some weeks have an election and uh, encourage the vote and have people very enthusiastically vote, actually over half a billion people coming to the polls. That's quite a remarkable thing because India is a very diverse, scattered place in many ways. There's many religions, many ethnic groups, many people of cultural, different cultural identities. And to be able to bring them together is a mark of the ancient tradition of India. You might say the cultural tradition, their common tradition of uh, the Vedic common tradition that holds the country together. But it also is a testimony to the tradition of tolerance that is one of the hallmarks of the culture in India. Tolerance and a sense of inclusion of people. And you see this demonstrated. Yes, you do have upsets, little things here and there, but by and large, it's very, very tolerant, particularly tolerant uh, to religions. Because in, in India, you have many different castes and creeds and beliefs. You have, uh, you, I could name perhaps a, a dozen different religious beliefs that people have there, but they're accepted, they're honored in their own way. And it's somewhat indicative of an Indian view of things that including other people in, you might say, one's universe is something that we in the West, I think, might be well advised to take heed of because it's a really a, a beautiful thing to see that. There's a story that Swami Krinanda used to like to say to tell and I suspect, I think it was actually from first-hand experience, he um, tells his story of meeting a missionary, Christian missionary, who had come to India to, you might say, share his beliefs and to set the locals straight in the, in the proper way to worship. And uh, our being our topic today. And he went to a village and the people, he was well-received, and the people took on the practices that he was suggesting of worshiping Jesus Christ. And they were enthusiastic about it, and they took on the practices. And then as his duties, the minister's duties, called him away to another area. And then he was gone for perhaps a month or two. But to his horror, when he returned to his village, he saw that they were doing arati to Krishna, and they were doing a Krishna arati, Hari Ram, Hari Ram, Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna. And he was aghast. And because what, what, and he admonished them afterwards, what's this? We had, you had become Christians, and you were, you know, it was Jesus Christ. And here I come back, and you've, you've uh, fallen back, and now you're worshiping Krishna. 
And they says, oh, yes, yes, yes. You know, he says, we love, we love Jesus Christ. We love Krishna. <laughs> and in a, in a sense, it, the, the picking up of one belief, the willingness to follow and honor and worship in one direction does not mean that one should not worship also something else again. And so consequently, it was a, it was a, there's a consciousness in India of both and rather than either this or that. And if we ask the question, what does it mean really to worship? Worship, I think, I, have, I should look this up, no, but uh, I should have looked it up, but I'm going to guess that the dictionary says <laughs> that, that to worship is to give reverence, special reverence to something, to honor, to give special reverence to something. This is what it means to worship. And so I give reverence to one great soul. I give reverence to another great soul. I give reverence to many things. And I think this is what we should ask ourselves as well in our life. What do we revere? Now, in terms of, and you think in religion, you think, oh, I revere this tradition or that tradition. But I think we want to take it broader than that. When we're thinking about worship, we might want to, you know, extend it, our circle, a little bit. What is it in our life that we hold in reverence? And I think it's something that, since my going to India, that I have been able to ex- expand my boundaries of what that might be. I hold many things in reverence. And so you find that in India too, many things are honored. Not to the exclusion of something else, but to the exclusion and to the inclusion of many things. And I think this is a, cult- this is a cultural trait. When I uh, recently, I picked up a friend at the airport and I saw her and she came up to me, she saw me in the airport, she touched my feet. Now the other people in the airport that might have thought that was strange, but it was a mark of reverence. A reverence in the sense that I was a teacher, and so she was honoring that. In India, your mother and father, you touch their feet. You revere them, you hold them high. You give them special honor because you revere and you worship that which gives you inspiration, that which uplifts you, that anything in life that takes you in the direction of soul freedom, that which your soul ultimately wants, that's worthy of reverence, isn't it? We revere those things. And so we look about the world and we say, what is it that uplifts me? What leads me to soul freedom? What do I honor as something, in the case of a mother and a father, as a channel for the Divine Mother and the Divine Father? And so consequently in India, you find this tradition of reverence in many, many ways that you might not find it so much in the West. Swami also, I remember him saying of a lady that in India, that he, maybe of his acquaintance or that somebody told him about, every week on, at a certain time during the week, she would listen to the radio to spiritual discourse on the radio. And it was, you know, similar to television or radio programs, spiritual topics. And as she would listen to that, she would take flowers. She'd put it on the radio. Wasn't that sweet? Because it's from that radio. Now, if she knew, of course, as she knew, but it was through that radio that inspiration was coming to her. And so consequently, in India, you'll find, since inspiration can come from many, many different sources, people will give reverence to that. And so in India, when travels about... Uh, you go and for example, we have a piece of property in, outside in the countryside in Pune. We travel there. There's a there's a special people tree, P E E P E L <laughs> people tree, that uh, I don't know why. Although people trees generally are held in reverence, uh, but there's it has become a shrine 
there. And it's in the, just in the countryside, and people stop, get out. They put flowers there under that special people tree. Or perhaps there's a stone somewhere, a special stone. People will see that stone, and for some reason, they'll honor that stone. And they'll, and they'll put a garland there. Or it's given some inspiration to that person, and a, and a tradition has been established there. In many different ways, you'll see little temples in the middle of a farmer's field. There'll be a little temple, maybe not too much, with a little image inside there. It's in his field. Or perhaps sometimes a road will be going along and it'll split and go around. And there's another little temple right in the middle of the roadway. And it's, it's a mark. It may not be convenient, but it basically, it, it, I've always found it quite sweet because it expresses a culture and a people that are honoring something. And if we, as individuals, have nothing in our lives that we honor, is that really a good thing? We have to, what is it that gives us inspiration? That's just what it would say. If we honor nothing, that we, we then it must be saying that we receive inspiration from nothing. But if we receive inspiration for something, isn't that whatever it is, worthy of honor and being revered in some way and recognizing it. And in the process of recognizing that, in some mysterious way, it begins to take on a certain power. Interestingly, now you'll see, if you give loving attention to certain things in your life, they begin to have a certain power. Perhaps not over to other people, but they have a certain power in relationship to you. There was, as you know from reading the autobiography of a yogi, that uh, Yogananda's guru's guru, his name was Lahiri Mahashai, and Lahiri Mahashai uh, lived in Benares, and uh, it was, this was in the 19th century, and so it was at a time when the technology of cameras were coming into vogue, and people uh, wanted to take his picture. And so they took his picture, one cameraman took his picture, but then it, it was quite uh, astonishing. He looked at the picture when it was developed, and where Lahiri Mahasha was supposed to be was a blank space. And so this, this uh, was quite remarked upon, and so they repeated this quite a few times. And, and whatever picture that was taken, Lahiri Mahasha, where he was supposed to be, was blank. They couldn't gain his image until finally one of the photographers begged his indulgence to allow him to take his picture and to be captured on the film, and he allowed it. And so there was one photograph, and that's from which the pictures of Lahiri Mahashai come. There was one photograph of Lahiri Mahashai, but one uh, woman took the picture, took that picture, and she kept it with her and mentioned to Lahiri Mahashai that she kept the picture as a symbol of divine protection. And he mentioned to her something that was really worth thinking about. He says, if you deem it as protection, it, so it will be. Otherwise, it's merely a picture. But if you deem it protection, so it will be. And so it was. And many, there are many other stories of people looking at that picture, taking that picture in devotion at times of crisis in their lives and having their lives be blessed or changed or protected in some fashion. But yet it's just a picture. Now, the same thing, there are many things in our life that come. If we deem it to be something, we imbue it with a certain blessing. We, we give it specialness in our lives. And if we hold things as holy and, and revere it in that way, it takes on a special power that is not only subjective. You might say the placebo effect. It's not just that. It takes on something if we if it has some intrinsic value, it'll have some intrinsic value of its own. And so the, often the, the principle you could say in this is the life is somewhat, it, how it responds to us is very dependent upon how we look upon it. 
if we look upon life as special, if we look upon life as an instrument through which God comes to us, and if we see life in that way, it responds to us in that way. Otherwise, it's just a picture. And I ask you, what is it in life that you look at in a special way? Some people, uh, you know, I asked uh, Krishna Das to sing that chant prior to meditation, Ram Prasad's chant, uh, Divine Mother Everywhere, uh, Ram Prasad, this is how, he was a great saint of Bengal. He saw Divine Mother everywhere, but then he says, blind eyes see the Ma hiding everywhere. And then he asks, he's asked in that chant, will that day come to me, Ma, when he can see God everywhere in everything? And those that are blind cannot see anything. And so it is. Some people see beauty in life. Some people see goodness in other people. Some people see opportunities. Some people see obstacles. Two fellows went to, two salesmen, they went to, uh, they were shoe salesmen. They went to a foreign land, landed. The one salesman gets off the boat. Notice that everybody's barefoot. Sends a cable back to the head company back in his home country. Says, returning home, no opportunity here. <laughs> Second salesman gets off the boat sees that everybody's barefoot, sends a cable back to the head office, send another supply, great opportunity for shoe sales here. <laughs> and in a sense, two people looking at life in exactly the same way. And so in the same thing is how do, you, how do we worship? We can worship God is everywhere. God is in everything. God is everything. But God is no one thing. He's beyond one thing. He's in everything. Nothing can contain the infinite, of course, but the infinite can be reflected in everything. And so you see all these special, in India, you see these different objects and you see people worshiping this and you're worshiping that. And people think, oh, that's, you know, that's silly. But it's not silly. There's an important message there. Now, and I wanted to read something from the autobiography of a, of a yogi. As you know, there's a wonderful story here. When, when Yogananda was a young man, he wanted to go to the Himalayas very badly, find God. He wanted, you know, it's a tradition, go off to the Himalayas. And, but his guru advised him, Sri Teshwar advised him, no, that's not, you know, the uh, mountains won't give you what you're looking for. But he, he had this heart's desire, and so he wanted to go. And so he went, he went to seek the advice, and he had heard about this very famous, or uh, well-regarded, he wasn't all that famous so much at that time, but a well-regarded saint called, named uh, Ram Gopal Musamdar. And he went, so he went out to see him. And he took a train and, and he, he got off at the uh, town where there's a great, very famous shrine there at uh, uh, Tarakeshwar. And he got off at Tarakeshwar and, there's, and it's very famous because there is a, a stone there it's a round stone, and this stone symbolizes, it's infinity. Or something is round, it's a sim symbol for the infinite. But it's like Lourdes or places like that, which have gained a certain amount of uh, power and, and uh, fame because it, healings take place, special blessings take place there. So he went there and he stopped by, saw the stone. But as he left, he, he didn't bow as one traditionally would, or prostrate oneself traditionally to the stone, because he says he was in a very austere mood. And, he, and in his mind he said, I, was, I felt that God should only be worshipped in the soul. So he didn't bow to the stone, and he went. And of course the story goes on that he had a terrible time after that trying to find Ram Gopal's house, and he would go left. He was always led in the wrong direction, and he was never seeming to get closer. It was very hot. Bengal can be very hot. And so and time went by, and he finally made it. And when he makes it to Ram Gopal's house, or meets him outside on the wayside there before he gets to his house, he's, uh, Ram Gopal asks him, tell me, where do you think God is? 
and Master Yogananda replies, why? He is within me and everywhere. I doubtless looked as bewildered as I felt. All pervading, eh? The saint chuckled. <laughs> then, why, young sir, did you fail to bow before the infinite in the stone symbol at the Tarakeshwar temple yesterday? Your pride caused you the punishment of being misdirected by the passers-by who was not burdened by the fine distinctions of left or right. <laughs> uh, today, too, you have had a fairly uncomfortable time with it. The devotee inclines to think his path to God is the only way. Yoga, through which the divinity is found within, is doubtless the highest road, so Lahiri Mahashaya has told us. But discovering the Lord within, we soon perceive him without. Holy shrines at Tarakshashwar and elsewhere are rightly venerated as nuclear centers of spiritual power. The Now remember, if you listen closely, it wasn't the fact that he didn't bow at Tarakshashwar. What did anybody remember what was it? It wasn't because he didn't bow that he ended up in so much trouble. It was his pride. It was his pride. And so consequently, many people bow down to nothing. Isn't it so? Look within. Isn't it so? Sometimes the thought of bowing down to something, venerating something, holding something as holy, revering. And so a person sometimes will have this attitude. There's something, and even this is a yogic attitude as well. People have this yoga, I'm Gyan Yogi. I'm Gyan Yogi, and I, in a sense, only worship the within. That which takes place without me is of no consequence. But to have this sort of attitude, we learn that, yes, life outside of ourselves does have confidence, it has consequences, and it's a mark of pride to believe that it doesn't. We have to honor God everywhere. As it says, we find God within but then we come to realize that God is everywhere. God is without. And we see God in the, in the children. We see God in the flowers. We see God in the circumstances. It's all part of the divine. And to everything, we give reverence. The devotee gives reverence. And to not give reverence is a mark of pride, spiritual pride. The Indian tradition is, of course, that there are thousands and thousands of gods and goddesses and 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 many people in the West will sometimes think, thousands, heck, there's probably millions, I would suspect. The, every little village has its own deity that might be a, an aspect of some other deity, but it has its own particularness to it. And many people in the West think, oh, it's very polytheist, poly, polytheism. But it's really not. If you really talk to even the villagers, if you really talk to them seriously, they know it's but a drop of, of something larger. Infinity, how, how can you possibly express infinity? It to, uh, how do you love abstract philosophy? Tatwam asi, or uh, even sat these are These are abstractions, but it's difficult to love that. To love something, we have to make it real to us. And so the infinite expresses in an infinite number of ways. And so consequently, people take some spark of that infinite, but they know that ultimately that's, that's, not, that's not the ultimate reality. It's just an expression. It's an ideal. So Swami often would like to use the term ideal worship, not idol worship. It's ideals that are expressed in a particular form. This is, uh, this, there was a nice story that uh, one of our monks told me last, oh, about a year ago. He was, uh, just how, in, in terms of how uh, people see things, he was in Mumbai, and Mumbai and Pune, where I stay much of the time, is part of the state of Maharashtra, central India. And it's a very uh, devout area of the country toward uh, Ganesha. And I think if those of you who know of Indian images, Ganesha has the elephant's head. And so it's, a, it's, 
it's uh, Ganesh worship is, is uh, prevalent there, revered. And so th this monk went to Mumbai and he was driving and the policeman stopped him to give him a ticket, a traffic ticket. And so the monk, in, in true Ananda monk fashion, pleaded his monasticism. Oh, I'm just a, I'm just a poor monk. I, I, can't you see? I'm wearing all yellow, and I just don't have any money. And it was probably true. And they didn't. And he was still speaking the truth. And you know, you must let me off. And this is this is a good argument, actually. It works pretty well. And so he. <laughs> Because then, you know, I don't think that would work in America so well. But in India, there's a reverence. There's a reverence. Okay, you're a monk. And, okay. And so he, he was, uh, they were arguing there about what the proper fine, whether you should let him go. And so he, he finally agrees. He says, okay, I'll let you go. He says, but don't do it again. And he says, but, he says, before you go, you must answer my question. He says, well, what is that? And the monk says, what's that? And the policeman says, Tell me, the Christians have one God. You know, the, 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 the Muslims, they have one God. Why do we Hindus, why do we have millions of gods? <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> and uh, the monk says, well, you see, there is only one God. You, you know, there's only one God, but God in, in his infinity takes many forms to each one to please his devotee. And the policeman says, ah... That's such a good answer. I like it. Thank you. He says, now I know Ganesha is the one God. <laughs> and away he went. <laughs> that probably is not going to happen in America like that. But every year they have the Ganesh festival in, in throughout Maharashtra at a certain time, usually in the September time. And it's not only Ganesh, but other, other deities as well have their festival times, Durga Puja, and, and, and a little bit later, and, the, and so on. They'll have their special pujas in which, which uh, villagers and many people, they'll make an image of Ganesh in this case, or Durga at the other time. And now you can go and buy these in the store, but it, traditionally you'd make your own, you know, out of mud, or ceramic of some sort. And you would... You would install the image, like, so let's say for Ganesh, let's say 10 days prior to the f festival conclusion, and you would offer flowers, you'd offer sweets, you'd offer your devotion for 10 days, and you would invest that image with your devotional life. And then at the end of the 10 days, at a certain day, everybody would take their image, and in Pune, uh, in Mumbai, they go to the sea. But in Pune, there's a river that comes right through the river. And the government will release large quantities of water that day. So the river's high. And uh, so they will go down to the river, and very lovingly, they place the image into the water. And what happens, of course, is it's traditionally, it would be a clay. It dissolves. It goes back to the infinite. And this is the spirit that God takes some form for the, to respond to the devotee, to the love of the devotee, but yet ultimately it's in not form at all. It dissolves back. You give it back to the infinite. And God is one. And ultimately, too, that, that oneness is something that each of us, when we meditate, when we practice our devotions, it's that same oneness in that image of Durga, that image of Ganesha, that we find within ourselves. They understand, their understanding of the tradition is that God expresses through many different channels. But the highest channel, what is that? And I think this too is recognized and understood. The highest channel is that God expresses most purely through the life of a God-realized saint. God takes form, or you might say, that saint that has overcome the ego, that saint that has achieved enlightenment, that, that saint who has attained oneness, that oneness into which that clay image is dissolved, who has attained that oneness, that is the highest expression. And it is those God-realized saints that are recognized as the true custodians of religion. 
They are the true living scripture. And it's the saints passed down every age, one after the next, centuries after century, that for thousands of years have kept the culture alive. Because they are the living scriptures. They are the actual expression of bringing truth into manifestation through their lives. And so you can see when you have uh, the, the culture recognizes that each of us has a responsibility, not just to worship and give reverence, which is, well, is our responsibility, but also on the deeper level, our responsibility is also in our own lives to express the highest, to express that oneness through an, throughout our own lives, to ultimately carry on that tradition of keeping religion alive and real through the expression of our own lives. And so this too is the responsibility that is passed down to each one of us. The, in that story of Tarakeshwar, um, Ram Gopal goes on, and actually I'll read it since I do have the page marked. He's, he's, uh, he, Master was going to the Himalayas wanted to go to the Himalayas very badly to find God. And Ramagopal says to him, Young yogi, I see you are running away from your master. He has everything you need. You must return to him. Mountains cannot be your guru. You see, it's, it's a living, the, living, the living saints must be that. Ram Gopal was repeating the same thought which Sri Yukteswar had expressed Masters are under no cosmic compulsion to limit their residence. My companion glanced at me quizzically. The Himalayas in India and Tibet have no monopoly on saints. What one does not, tru what one does not trouble to find within will not be discovered by transporting the body hither and yon. As soon as the devotee is willing to go even to the ends of the earth for the spiritual enlightenment, his guru appears nearby. Then Ramagopal asks him, are you able to have a little room where you can close the door and be alone? Yes, master said. That is your cave. The yogi bestowed on me a gaze of illumination which I have never forgotten. That is your sacred mountain. That is where you will find the kingdom of God. And I think this is what he's saying to each one of us. Do you have a little place where that you can go? Do you have a place that you can close the door, be alone with God? If you do, that is your cave. You don't need the outward ritual. You don't need the outward pilgrimage. But yet we revere it and we honor it nevertheless. But when we come back, the true pilgrimage is to go inside, to contact God and gurus there in our own soul and to give loving worship with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Many blessings. I've heard your flute high on a cloud Your call I can't resist Oh, let me come and play with you We'll scatter music with the dew And sound the morning mist I've heard you piping on a hill All else I've set aside Come let us dance the mountain peaks We'll skip with breezes on the creeks and so the valleys wide.
fields Now I've no place to live Don't send me back, rejected friend Whatever I call mine must end All that I am I give I hear your call from every tree, from every flower and stream, and sweet as melody of all, a song that heaven's joy recalls here in my heart. You see, ooh, ooh, ooh.